stage five of the Tour de France. Yesterday in Vars, Jemodelin Abdou Japarov of the Soviet Union won his second stage of the Tour de France, but only after surviving a protest from the Belgian rider Johan Museu. The yellow jersey, no change there. It stays firmly on the shoulders of Rolf Sonsen of Denmark. Hello and welcome to the start of the fifth stage of the Tour de France. We're in Rast this morning and the caravan already heading out now. That, as usual, starting one hour before the riders follow suit. Well, Ross Sorensen told me last night that he hopes he will hold on to that yellow jersey at least until the crucial time trial on Saturday in the north of France. Let's have a look then at the overall situation. Sorensen's lead, still a tenuous one, just 10 seconds ahead of Greg LeMond, 12 seconds ahead of Eric Broikink, and 14 seconds ahead of Sean Kelly, with the sprinter Abdou Japarov in fifth position. For the other contenders for this year's Tour de France, there's still a lot of ground to make up. In 47th place, Miguel Indurain, 52nd, Gianni Bugno, 56th, Robert Miller, 57th, Claudio Chiapucci, and in 60th place, the 1988 winner, Pedro Delgado. And another rider who knows what it's like to wear the leader's yellow jersey in the Tour de France, Ronan Pensek, was in trouble yesterday. He punctured just four kilometres from the finish when the bunch was in full cry. Two of his teammates dropped back, but he still lost over 30 seconds. An example, though, of teamwork as they fell back to pace him back towards the field. There was an even better example of teamwork at the front of the race, though. Here's Paul Sherwin to explain that. Yesterday's stage showed some team tactics straight out of the handbook. When a team has a good sprinter, as the Italian Carrera team does, they will try and get him to the finish line in the best possible position, as we see Eric Makler and Guido Bontempi doing here for Jamaluddin Abdusaparov. They will bury themselves over the last couple of kilometers to make sure there are no last-minute attacks and to keep the speed high so that their rider will not be swamped by the other sprinters. Abdusaparov will remain in their slipstream, saving all his energy for that final burst of the line. Two riders attack here, but Bontempi doesn't panic. He just continues and slowly catches them back. The only mistake that they made was to leave Adjuzaparov just too far from the line. 450 meters to go for a sprinter is too far. But using some dubious sprinter's maneuvers, he manages to hold on right to the line. It's going to be very close. He may have gone too soon because Museo is trying to get through, bouncing off the side of the barriers. But you'll never beat Adjuzaparov. I've seen him do that before in the middle race and winner's stage. And the route the riders face today is going to be possibly the hottest of the tour. Temperatures forecast in the high 30s Celsius. It's a flattish road of 149.5 kilometres, three spins along the route, and perhaps Sean Kelly can get in there and pinch enough seconds to give him the race leader's yellow jersey. Let's hope so. At the start this morning, the yellow jersey of Ron Sonson, looking quite content in the sunshine, leaving grass. And Lawrence Roach, still in the race, despite his problems yesterday with that crash and uh, living up to the true traditions of the Tour de France. You may be injured, but you go on. Gary Imlach will be profiling Lawrence, our rookie of the Tour, after we come back after the break. On the first and only climb of the day, the climb at Mont Cornet, after 48 kilometres, Mark Maddio, in a small breakaway, was leading Ludwig Willems, the Belgian, and Ron Kiefel from the American Motorola team. And on the second sprint we've had so far, the Ere La Viville, after 79 and a half kilometres. Peter de Klerk in the polka dot jersey as leader in the King of the Mountains, was ahead of Ron Kiefel and Ludwig Willem. But since then, the breakaway has been caught. Now, in answer to your many questions, and thanks for sending them all in, we'll do what we can to answer most of them. Here's a few for today. The question about crash helmets being compulsory, the answer is certainly yes, but the professionals have a choice. They can wear what they refer to as hairnets, or they can wear the all-solid cask type of a helmet. They have the choice themselves to make, but the actual wearing of a crash helmet is compulsory this year in all cycle races. 
and when a rider falls in the last kilometer the rule where you take the same time as the winning rider of the day only applies if you are in the main field of the race and of course in the group from where the winner comes in a time trial as in the case of Rolf Sorensen the other day there is no such rule and you must get up and continue to the finish as fast as you can changing tyres according to the weather that's an interesting one as in Formula 1 car racing but in fact because stage racing is spread over a number of hours one doesn't normally change tyres because one simply doesn't know what the weather is going to do but if you are riding over a short distance yes you might well change tyres to suit the conditions and why are all the riders given the same time in a sprint finish it's because if they weren't of course you would really fight to get to the front to get the best time and I would imagine there would be absolute carnage in the final dash for the line providing that there is no obvious gap between the riders the photo finish will decide their placings on the day and everybody in the big bunch will be given the same time front to back and what do all the sponsors do in the race well that would take too long to tell you but to give you some idea they range from practically every major corporate body in the world from Panasonic, electrical like Toshiba, you can go down to main kitchen manufacturers and you can go to even the makers of fine furniture. Surprisingly, and this is possibly down to cost, there are no major sponsors now from the cycling world because it is simply too expensive to run a sponsored team. But many of the bicycle manufacturers, as in the case in Rally Industries in Britain, they do supply bicycles to the teams. Well, this breakaway in the last 30 kilometres of the race now might well be the decisive one, but my goodness me, there's been plenty of attacks today by the riders trying to be first to Valenciennes, none of the main leaders of the Tour, but plenty of attacks by riders who want to succeed at least for a while. And Sean Yates has made this breakaway, riding on the American Motorola team. The 186 here is Pascal Lance, and Paul Sherwin alongside me has a whole list in the group. Well, I think we've got nine riders in the group there, Phil. We've got a good gap there. You can see that gap's around about 35, 40 seconds. Dirk De Wolf from Tonton Tapia is in there. Sean Yates from England, from Forest Row in Sussex, is there also, so that's good for us. Um, Olaf Ludwig is there. He's obviously been a bit surprised by getting beaten a couple of days on the run in the sprint, so he's up there. Uh, Zhidanov is there from the TVM squad. Frederick Vichot is there also from the Castorama squad. Jos van Aert, a good rider from PDM, is up in the breakaway group and also Twan Pools from Buckler. So let's have a look down at the main field to see who's chasing, and it looks as if it is the Ariostia team of the yellow jersey who have taken up the chase. Well, the interesting move here is, Paul, in such a sizable group like this, there's a lot of different teams represented, therefore we could expect a lot of defending going be going on at the back in the main field. Well, definitely. There are some very good teams represented there. There's PDM, Buckler, Panasonic, Motorola. They'll all be wanting to stop this, uh, this chase going on. The Ariostia boys there definitely want to get it back together again because they want to keep Rolf Sorensen in that yellow jersey for as long as possible. He said he wants to keep it up until the time trial and see how things go after that. Well, sadly for us, of course, Twan Pools, who rides here in this breakaway for the Buckler team, was the last rider named for the Buckler squad before the tour started. And it was between Twan Pools and our own David Rayner. And Rayner was the unlucky one who didn't make the split. So Twan Pools has honored his selection and he's now in the lead group here. Yeah, what I forgot to tell you there, Phil, was the one man alone in front is Mauro Gianetti from the Helvetia La Swiss team. He was away actually before this breakaway formed, but it looks as if they're about to catch him. They're in third position there in the blue and red jersey. We just caught a glimpse of Sean Yates. Well, Gianetti, here he is, Helvetia La Suisse, being brought back now, but he, I don't think he seriously expected to stay away. He'd only just broken away. That group quickly formed behind him, and now he's going to find he's got what he wanted, and that is a nice group with not too many riders to contend with and if they can now all settle down and work together they could pull away from this field because really if we look at the contenders for long-term prospects in the Tour de France I would say none of these will be heading for first place in Paris and that is equally what the main field will assess and they might well now feel that the pressure can go off and this group can move away that's certainly what this group will be thinking one thing that must be going through Sean Yates' mind there is he was in a little breakaway group like this in the Tour of Switzerland just recently with none other than Olaf Ludwig. And Ludwig went on to take the stage victory and Sean Yates took third place. But Yates, when he needs to, can put in a very fine sprint up. But I wonder if he's fast enough to surprise Olaf Ludwig if it came to the final. Well, this is Ludwig right in our picture now. And he is a frightening man when you stand alongside him. He's a pure sprinter. 
although having said that he's the reigning Olympic road race champion having won his title in Seoul in 1988 and since then East Germany was allowed to turn professional and since then of course East Germany has disappeared so last year he became the first and last East German to win a stage of the Tour de France which he did at Besançon and here's a wonderful sight in the Tour de France. All of the Ariostia team now leading their man in yellow, Rolf Sorensen. There he is. His eight teammates now are driving the field along to try and close down this breakaway. They are fighting daily to keep this man in the yellow jersey for as long as possible because with any Tour de France, if you're in yellow, you're getting maximum publicity and that's what they're thinking of. And here they are, all eight riders left on the team of the nine men. The ninth, of course, is Sorensen. He'll be told to sit at the back of the train and ride as easy as he can. The rest are working one and one. And so there's still a long way to go to Valenciennes. The picture could change yet, but we'll take a short break. Now, as you know, Stephen Roach is out of this year's race, the 1987 winner falling victim to a mix-up over the start of his team time trial. And his early departure not only leaves Tonton Tapie without a team leader, it also leaves Lawrence Roach to face the rest of his first ever Tour de France without the benefit of his older brother's experience to help him through. The sad sight of a lone Stephen Roach chasing his own teammates in the time trial sums up his past few seasons. Poor health, injuries and a combination of what he calls the little things have combined to stop him building on his 87 treble of the Giro, the Tour and the World Championships. In that year, he went home to Ireland a hero. Now he heads back to his wife, children and trophies to ponder his future. Some of his thoughts, though, will be back on the Tour with his brother Lawrence. He may not be a top rider, but I think he can be a very good rider. He needs the Tour de France to, to, to bring him on another step. But Lawrence didn't start well, losing nearly nine minutes on the leaders during the opening stage in Lyon. Yeah, I was a bit stuck to the road this morning. I, I, normally, I, for, normally the first, the first day in a tour, or the first two days normally in a tour, I'm, I never, never really go well. And uh, I think that showed this morning. <laughs> it just went off, uh, went from the blocks like. After the fiasco of the team time trial, Lawrence was lying 193rd, 11 minutes 23 off the pace. But the real test of character came on the longest stage of the tour from Dijon to Reims, when he limped in just ahead of the broom wagon on a borrowed bike after crashing. Well, I just, I just got brought back and then uh, so was about, I was in the bunch and then there was a uh, kind of corner over, over to the left and then uh, everyone jammed on and I went through. There was a bit of a crash. I went to work and then I wrecked my bike as well. Like, I bike about three times since I was big. Okay, but okay to, okay to carry on. Oh, yeah. So not the finest few days in the racing life of the Roach brothers, but the family name is still in the race. Lawrence, despite his injuries, started today's stage, and he's with the pack, so far as we know, on the road to Valenciennes. Thanks, Gary, and here is Lawrence Road sitting at the back of the main field, which is now in full cry. In fact, they've just swept up that breakaway containing Sean Yates, and they've now got a bigger problem on their hands because the whole of the Z team have got themselves together at the front. The reason being, Claudio Chiapucci, and you can't predict this man at all, has gone out with an attacking group containing Maurizio Fondrias, Gianetti, De Wolf, and Montoya. Now, Chiapucci is a real danger, and just look at this here because that's Patrick Jacobs who's pushing over Robert Miller and this is Duclo Lazal, the Z team leader who's now beginning to have a contretemps with Jacobs because they want to get to the front here. There's something of a panic set in with the fact that Kia Pucci on a day he wasn't supposed to has gone off on the attack towards Valenciennes. And just look at this, all of the Z riders now are doing their job well. They've got to bring down this breakaway, Paul, because there's bonuses for the first three finishes. There's round about a 25-second advantage for Kia Pucci. If, if it all worked out for him, he could steal a minute today. Well, definitely, but there's also a question of pride here as well because Kia Pucci has said some very, very sharp things about Greg LeMond in the press. They said that he doesn't think Greg LeMond can win the Tour de France. He's bluffing. He said he thinks he's a rigolo because he, uh, he only took the yellow jersey on the last day of the Tour de France. 
So I think that's another reason why the Z team have decided we'll get to the front and try and sort this out. One or two of the Gatorade uh, Chateau Dax riders in there as well to help them because there's no love lost between Gianni Bugno and Chiapucci either. Well, with five kilometres to go, it may well be that Claudio Chiapucci won't uh, come up with the goods today because the gap has come down to 17 seconds, as you can see there. You've got all the Z riders really pulling everything out at the front there, trying to catch them up. Sorensen taking a little bit of a back seat today. His team now, after all the work they've done earlier, having a little bit of a rest. Uh, Fondriest uh, still forcing, still wanting to stay away, but it's going to be very close on the line here. Well, again, we have a very difficult approach towards the finishing line, though it's a superb finish today. It is a little bit tortuous, and that roundabout, there is a nasty roundabout, in fact, that comes at exactly 1,000 metres from the line. And this is the breakaway group. Jack DeWolf sitting at the back, a rider who turned professional in 1983, and we might best remember him back home in England when he won the Sealink International Race, one of the last races he rode as an amateur in 1982. But look at this, Paul, and no sooner have we spoke about the condition, there's been a big pile-up down there. A touch of wheels as they were coming back together after that roundabout. One, two, three, four riders are down. There's a Motorola rider down on the left of our camera there. Looks like Andy Bishop is the Motorola rider there. He's had a bit. Of, he's not very pleased with that. Uh, and this is the problem you can have when you go around these directional islands. The, the race splits into two. The riders separate and come back into together again. And then when they're coming back together, you just need two riders to touch each other, and that's when the problem happens. That's definitely what's happened here. This break is still just 10 seconds clear as we come to with about five kilometers to go. They're still holding on, but I think it's going to be an incredible bunch sprint like we haven't seen before. The last few years, there's been so many breakaways in the Tour de France, and this year seems to be the year of the sprinter. Well, for a moment then, I thought we were going to have a glimpse backwards, but our cameraman lost... Uh lost his direction a little bit this is the breakaway though and the man setting the pace is Claudio Chiapucci he's a rider so different now 100% improved since last year when he was a surprise package in the Tour de France breaking away on the very first day and then finally leading the race and then losing it only on the last weekend of the Tour de France he finished second of course he's risen to, risen to the occasion now he is a real star in the world of cycling, ranked officially the world number two bike rider. And look at the split in the peloton, which has been caused by that crash. Now, it'll be very interesting to see, because I would imagine, Paul, that practically all of the Z team are in this league group. Well, this is something you've got to be very careful of. That's why it's important to ride near the front. I can't see the yellow jersey of Roland Sorensen in that front group either. You have to ride near the front of the bunch all the time all the way down to the mountains if you want to win the Tour de France because you can lose a minute or a minute and a half just on a silly mistake like this. This is for um, Philippe Casado who's done his turn. He's just slipping to the back there. But look at the uh, devastation that that crash has caused. There's about 20 men there chasing the group of five at the top of the screen there. That is the group of five riders. They're about to be reabsorbed and then the bunch is split into two behind as well. So it's almost over but this has hurt the race for sure and uh, this a gadfly of the Tour de France, Claudio Chiapucci, has annoyed them again today. And uh, he is going to receive one or two hard words from a few bike riders, I would think, because he's hurt them for the second day running. They chased him for 40 kilometers yesterday. He's done it again today, and his popularity will be on a high with the Italian uh, Tifosi tonight. I don't think he'll survive now. It would be lovely if he did, but the leading part of the main peloton is scrambling across the gap and goodness knows what damage he's caused. We're inside, I think that banner is about four kilometers from the finish. It might be the five kilometer banner to go. You can see the crowds here now, and they're virtually closing the roads for the Tour de France. You just follow the crowd line and you shouldn't miss a bend. This is the chase group, and it's interesting to note that this is Sean Kelly in second place too. And coming through, one of the Motorola riders, and I think it's Steve Bauer who's going through and attacking. Steve Bauer, a man of the north of France, second in Paris-Roubaix a year ago and fourth in Paris-Roubaix. He's always inspired in this area of France. Well, he always seems to have ridden well. He had a very bad uh, year this year in the World Cup races. Fondriès there being caught by Bauer. It's incredible that he's never been able to do... He didn't do very well in the World Cup series, but as soon as it came to Paris-Roubaix, he rode extremely well. Paris-Roubaix comes through Valenciennes, and maybe that's what's inspired him, but it looks as if he also has now been reabsorbed by that front part of the peloton. So there we've got now the pink jerseys of the Lotto riders taking over, trying to place their, or their sprinter into orbit. And so the lead part of the Tour de France comes together. The sprinters might snatch it on the day in the end. Claudio Chiapucci... 
is being brought back to heel. Now we can only assume that Greg LeMond is in that group. I haven't. Well, oh, another, another crash ball, crash uh, touching the barriers down. again. They're going down like flies here at the moment. I can't see the yellow jersey in there. I can only presume that Greg LeMond is in there. Well, this is amazing. They are in such a state of panic now. They've caught the man. But that was another touch of wheels on the far side there. And I don't know if you saw the riders sitting, standing up. He almost got knocked down again by the next part of the group. And now we have another attack. And this looks like Yellow Nidam, a rider who takes his chances in the closing kilometres of stage in the Tour de France. He's done it before in this manner so many times. He has tremendous turn of speed once he gets off the front. As he lines up for the finish, they're all after him. But Nida might well do this. The Buckler team who haven't won a stage. And now they've come out of nowhere. And Nida is going to do it. Nida takes it on the line. And he's chased by Olaf Ludwig. And just behind Olaf Ludwig, I don't think too far away, was Sean Kelly. And the field now scrambling for the seconds they've lost in the end. But what a tremendous end to the Tour de France today. And Gianni Bugno has come in, and I tell you, he's lost about 20 seconds, banging the handlebars, absolutely livid with the way this race has gone over these closing kilometres. And this is the finish, reminiscent of a couple of days ago when Etienne de Vilda hung on to, for victory. But this time it is Yella Nidam who escapes and gives the Buckler team the traditional early stage win in a stage of the Tour de France. And the field completely split up towards the end of this stage of the Tour de France. And what is confirmed is that the yellow jersey Rolf Sorensen has been involved in a crash some three kilometres out and will certainly lose his yellow jersey tonight as he finishes in some distress. Well, let's go down now immediately to Paul Sherwin. He's with Sean Kelly, who could be the new leader of the tour. Sean, that was total carnage on the way in today. There were people dropping like flies. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was so fast all day, and in the final, uh, it was so fast. Uh, actually, in the sprint of 50Z12, that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't come off the wheel of Bowden in the last 200 metres. I was just pedalled out around a 53Z12. So it just, told, it just goes to show the speed we were doing. We must be doing. I, I would say 70 kilometers an hour Ready? easy in, this, in the final. Ready? Well, you're very close to the jersey, Sean. I know there was a split in the field there, and uh, we're just waiting for the timekeepers to confer confirm how close that is. Well, I heard there was a crash uh, in the final in the last uh, about four kilometers, five kilometers before the finish, I think it was. But uh, yeah, I was uh, I was there on the first 10 rider, so I didn't I didn't really see what happened. I just heard from both and a teammate. He said there was a crash, and I was uh, I was up there just waiting for the sprint, and uh, then I am. Um, Neither him attacked just off the, around the kilometre and uh, he was going very fast. So at a time like that you weren't even thinking about trying to get the yellow jersey, it was just a question of staying alive? Yeah, it's just a question of staying upright and uh, watch where you're going because uh, the run-ins are quite dangerous, there's a lot of roundabouts and a lot of violence in the middle of the road, so yeah, you can't be thinking about what's happening behind you, just, uh, you just watch the wheel in front of you and look out, uh, you know, play safe and try and not come down because it's so dangerous, these sprints, uh, they really can be gassy. Well, it's now some two and a half hours since the race finished and the organisation is still confused as to who is leading the Tour de France. The confusion has been caused by the fact that Rolf Sorensen has finished in the main field, nursing a broken collarbone, 13 seconds behind, and that the confusion has been caused by the fact he's finished on a teammate's bicycle and the number on that bicycle shown up on the photo finish. At first it was believed that Rolf Sorensen finished more than a minute behind. So Sorensen has gone away to hospital tonight, no yellow jersey awarded at all, and Sorensen has confirmed that he has a broken collarbone. But technically, because he crossed the finishing line, he is still the leader of the Tour de France until the start tomorrow, and he still has the right to take that start if he can. So, let's first of all confirm the overall result of the stage. Yellen Idam, the winner there, ahead of the sprinters, Remig Stumpf and Olaf Ludwig. Now the all-important overall. Tonight, it is like this. Rolf Sorensen, still the leader of the Tour de France, by nine seconds from Greg LeMond, ten seconds from Sean Kelly, and 16 seconds from Eric Broikink. But it seems very unlikely that Sorensen will come out tomorrow, and we should see Greg LeMond taking the yellow jersey, which would give him just a one-second advantage over Sean Kelly, and the prospect of a great battle on the road tomorrow. So, for the moment, from France, and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow, and we'll see just who is wearing that yellow jersey. Phil Liggett saying goodbye for Paul Sherwin and Gary Imlach.
The Tour de France makes, then breaks the dreams of Rolf Sorensen. He crashes near the end yesterday and left for hospital in tears. The diagnosis, a broken collarbone.